All right, video number two, Mesopotamia. So this is going to be kind of those first civilizations that develop after, um, you know, villages and after cities develop. All right, as promised, ancient Sumer is going to be your first one, and it's about 3,000 to 2,000 BC. You can say they lasted about 1,000 years. Um, this is not like a unified civilization. There are a bunch of smaller city-states that kind of have a shared language, a shared belief, a shared system of life. And a couple of the best-known cities are Ur, Uruk, and Nippur. And they have a governor known as an Ensi. And a lot of historians think that they were probably elected, but we can't guarantee it. We do know that whoever the Ensi was, they had help from the priests. And the priests weren't just over religion. The priests were also in charge of agriculture. Uh, the priests are the ones that talk to the gods, so they told people when to plant and when to harvest. The gods would say, go plant now or go harvest now, and then the priests would tell the people. Because the priests talk to the gods, they're also the ones in charge of irrigation, they control the water, and the temples kind of serve as storage facilities for all the food, too. Cuneiform, which was the writing style, is developed by the priests to keep track of business transactions. They would keep track of how much grain and how much food you brought in and then how much grain or how much food you took out so the original writing style was an accounting system set up by priests uh, the sumerian cuneiform was also used for laws and it was used to develop math as well um, some of the the math they used it was based on the number 60 um, you think of inches feet hours, degrees in a circle, all of that is math based off Sumeria. 60, 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 360 degrees in a circle, etc, etc. Uh, the laws were all about ethical guidance, and I'll just kind of read you two of them here. Uh, one Sumerian law said, if a man rented an ox and damaged its eye, he shall pay one half of its price. If you damage somebody's property, you have to pay for that property. Another one, uh, if a man entered the orchard of another man and was seized there for stealing, he shall pay 10 shekels of silver. So if you're caught stealing, you have to make it right. Now, there are also some Sumerian proverbs that help with ethical guidance as well. Uh, one such proverb is, a sweet word is everybody's friend. Another Sumerian proverb, into an open mouth a fly enters. In other words, keep your mouth quiet. And there in the bottom right corner, you can see some examples of cuneiform there. Now, Sumerian religion, it was polytheistic, and that should say multiple gods, not multiple dogs. Uh, that's an embarrassing typo, but I'm going to leave it there for humility's sake. So that should say multiple gods. Uh, their primary gods were An, Ki, Enlil, and Shemesh, and these weren't exactly friendly gods. They were hostile towards humans. Uh, they would bring floods and droughts if they were angry at the people, and the people would have to speak to the priests and figure out how to make the gods happy. Now, these religion, uh, religious figures and the idea of religion was to help the Sumerians explain the meaning of life. They didn't understand meteorology. They just knew it rained a lot and wanted to know why. And so these gods helped them explain that. Uh, you also have temples known as ziggurats. They were in the middle of the Sumerian cities. And there were also rituals designed to please these Sumerian gods. Second of the civilizations you need to know are the Babylonians, uh, roughly 2000 to 1500 BC. Uh, they were originally known as Amorites. And they kind of moved into Sumerian territory around 2000 BC and they didn't kill them off they just kind of intermingled and took over uh, they didn't destroy Sumerian culture they adopted it they integrated it and they made it better now the best known leader of the Babylonians is a guy named Hammurabi he lived around 1700 BC and the Babylonians were fairly peaceful and they were bit business like they were worried about making money and this picture here on the right hand side the one seated in the throne is supposed to be Hammurabi so that's a picture of him what are the Babylonians best known for well something called the code of Hammurabi 
the Code of Hammurabi is one of the best known and most important legal codes of all time. You've heard of this before and you may not even realize it. Um, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth is how it's thought of, but that's never actually said in the, the laws of um, Hammurabi. Uh, the, the laws apply to everybody, but depending who you are, they apply differently. Uh, women and slaves are treated differently than commoners. Commoners are treated differently than nobles, but the laws do apply in some way, shape, or form to everybody. Uh, one example of one of these codes, if a man has accused a man and cast against him an accusation of murder and has not proved it against him, his accuser shall be put to death. So if you accuse somebody of murder and you can't prove your case, then you yourself will die for making a false accusation. If a man strikes the daughter of a free man and causes her to cast that which is within her womb, meaning causes a miscarriage, he shall pay 10 shekels of silver for that which is within her womb. If the woman dies as a result of the miscarriage, they shall put his daughter to death. So if a man hits a woman and causes a miscarriage, he has to pay for the miscarriage. If a man hits the woman and the woman dies because of the miscarriage, his own daughter has to die too. So it's very much this idea of an eye for an eye, even if they don't actually say it. A Babylonian literature is another very important thing. Um, the Babylonians, they could solve quadratic equations. They kept astronomical records. There's this tablet called the Amasaduga. It's an astronomical observation of the planet Venus. It went on for 21 years. And when modern day NASA scientists went back and studied it, they found out that this 21 year observation of Venus was accurate. And they modeled the fact that Venus would have been where the Babylonians said it was at that time. Now, Marduk is gonna become the primary Babylonian God. He replaces Enlil. And then there's lots of stories built around Marduk. But as exciting as it is to have the science and the, the religion, the big cool thing is the Epic of Gilgamesh, which becomes the first epic poem. And Gilgamesh, he's going to be this great Sumerian king. Um, he's kind of the hero, if you will. And in this story, Gilgamesh meets, uh, he's kind of like full of himself. He's, he celebrates a new marriage by sleeping with the wife, things like this. Um, and to kind of knock him down a notch, the gods create a being called Enkidu or Enkidu and Enkidu is going to fight Gilgamesh they fight to a draw Enkidu becomes human and becomes Gilgamesh's best friend they go on different quests together and eventually Enkidu is going to die and Gilgamesh tries to find the secret to everlasting life because he's been face to face with death for the first time. And unfortunately, because Gilgamesh is so full of himself, he fails the mission to everlasting life and he himself dies, but he's a much more humble man once he realizes that death is inevitable. Now, the third group are the Assyrians, and these guys are kind of mean. Uh, 1000 to 612 BC, uh, they've been around for a while. The Assyrians have been kind of in Northern Mesopotamia, the northern Middle East, if you will. But around 1000 BC, they go on the war path and become the most dominant civilization. And their civilization is completely devoted to the war. They engineer for war, they science for war, they religion for war, they art for war, they literature for war, everything's for war. The Assyrians are the ones that invent and create the chariots. Uh, they put science behind it. They use astronomy to predict eclipses. And when an eclipse hits, they attack their enemies. Uh, their god Asher was the war god. He was originally the agriculture god, but I guess war became big business. And then their war, their art is focused on war. Their literature is about war. Their stories about war. Their music is about war. Everything's about war. And they're going to end up conquering a huge area there. Their territory stretch all the way from modern day Turkey down to Egypt. And to keep people from revolting, they use terror and death and destruction. Assyrian loss. You can probably guess this, but they're violent just like their culture. Um, here's an example for you. If a woman has damaged a man's testicle in a quarrel, they shall cut off one of her fingers. If she has damaged the second testicle in the quarrel, they shall tear out both her ovaries. 
That's pretty gruesome. If a woman by her own deed has cast that which is within her womb, meaning a, an abortion or miscarriage, and a charge has been brought and proved against her, they shall impale her and bury her not. If she dies from casting that which was, was in, within her womb, they shall impale her and not bury her. So if a woman causes the death of her child before the child is born, they're going to kill her. And even if she dies from the miscarriage, they're going to kill her anyways. So Assyrian laws are pretty violent. And if you can't tell, women are given very low status. And they have some pretty severe penalties for anybody committing adultery, anybody committing abortion, and homosexual rape. Now you might ask, why are the penalties so harsh for those three things? Because they're all about war. They need strong young boys to grow up, be strong young men to be strong young warriors. Now, the last of these four groups are the Chaldeans, uh, 612 to 539 BC. They're also known as the New or Neo-Babylonians. Their best known ruler is a guy named Nebuchadnezzar. And he kind of, he tried to restore the image and the memory of the old Babylonians. Um, the people, they didn't like the way the Assyrians treated them. They were scared of the Assyrians. And Nebuchadnezzar tries to wipe them off the face of history. Uh, problem is people don't forget when it's all about death and destruction so the people were really really skeptical nebuchadnezzar is going to do everything he can to bring back the babylonian lifestyle he's going to move the capital of the city of babylon he's going to bring back the code of hammurabi he's going to get rid of the god asher and reinstate marduk he's going to build ziggurats and the chaldeans or the neo-babylonians they're really wealthy and really powerful but People are just so distrustful that they don't succeed. Uh, the final king, a uh, guy named Belshazzar, uh, when the Persian army comes to fight his city, he just says, you know what? The walls of Babylon will protect me. He closes the gates and has a giant party. Well, he's so full of himself that he doesn't realize that one of his own people opens up the gate and the Persians come in and destroy the Neo-Babylonians and the Persian Empire destroys the Chaldeans. Now, the Persian Empire, that's going to be a story for another day. So, all right, so that is your video. Uh, the video one and video two both posted today. Um, at the end of each video, I'm going to put in a secret word and then do every Sunday, just like the rest of your work, you're going to have a secret word quiz, painfully easy. All you have to do is watch these videos and give me what the secret word is at the end of the week and it will be very obvious because i will stop i will say here is your secret word i will give you the word i'll repeat the word and then i'll continue uh, once again i'm just doing that to make sure you watch these videos because they are important so your secret word for this week because yesterday was memorial day i'm going to make it fireworks some of you probably had fireworks that you shot off or some of your neighbors might have had fireworks so the word is fireworks. So look for a quiz where you have to answer that one word, fireworks. All right, until next time, have a good weekend. We will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.